bombings in Israel detonated a bag full of explosives. They were one of the pioneers of the suicide bomb and have waged a decades-long campaign of terror against Israel. Hamas, founded as an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, took control of Gaza after winning a shock election there in 2006 and has since ruled it with an iron fist. On Saturday, they led an attack into Israel which killed at least 1,200 people, most of them civilians, with such brutality that the terror group is now being compared to ISIS. Their goal seems to have been to provoke Israel into a devastating ground war in Gaza in order to derail a new peace effort and send the Middle East spiraling once again into conflict. These are the deep contradictions at the heart of Sunni Hamas, their perhaps unlikely allies in Shia Iran, and how, together, they threaten to destabilize the world. Hamas was founded in 1987 during the first intifada by Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, a student of the Muslim Brotherhood, to act as their Palestinian arm. Its ultimate aim, as spelled out in its founding covenant, is to wage jihad and destroy the state of Israel. It is deeply opposed to any kind of talks or peace deal with the Israelis. By engaging in ISIS-style terror, the jihadists seem intent on dragging Israel into a brutal ground war that they hope will spiral to include Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and Iranian proxies in Syria, which in turn will drag in America and Iran, sparking an all-out Middle East war with the aim of wiping out Israel. Although Hamas also has a civilian arm which carries out many of the functions of a government, like paying social security, it controls an increasingly sophisticated military wing, the al Qassam Brigades, which operate out of a tunnel network beneath Gaza and are responsible for scores of attacks on Israel. Religiously Sunni, the group at first had good relations with the likes of Saudi Arabia and Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, who provided it with funding. Hezbollah's paymasters, who are Shia. Tehran is now thought to provide the bulk of the group's weapons and money, sending an estimated $100 million each year, along with explosives and missile technology. The meeting took place in 1992. Amid a push for a peace deal between Israel and Palestinian leaders, more than 400 members of Hamas and other terror groups were exiled to southern Lebanon to stop them from sabotaging the process. The area is Hezbollah territory, and no doubt the Israelis were hoping the two groups would either ignore each other or begin fighting. But instead, they began cooperating. Hezbollah and Iran shared training and resources with Hamas, including how to carry out suicide bombings, which Hezbollah had pioneered against the Israelis in the 1980s. When those exiles returned to Gaza in 1993, following international pressure on Israel, they unleashed a deadly wave of suicide attacks aimed at turning the Israelis and the Palestinians against one another. Over the next three years, dozens of suicide bombings were carried out inside Israel, which killed hundreds of people, scuppering the Oslo Accords, which were working towards a two-state solution. In 2000, amid a new push for peace, Hamas was heavily involved in the Second Intifada, a violent uprising that involved more suicide bombings and, for the first time, rocket attacks. The orgy of violence that followed lasted five years and left some 3,000 Palestinians and 1,000 Israelis dead, effectively killing any hope of a deal between the two sides. In the wake of the Intifada, Israel agreed to withdraw from Gaza and hand control over to Palestinian groups, with Hamas winning a shock election victory there in 2006. But relations quickly broke down and after a short and bloody war between the two sides, Hamas seized full control in 2007. Israel blockaded the Gaza Strip in response and an impasse set in which continues to this day. Hamas is now run by Ismail Haniya, who took over following Yassim's death in 2004 in an Israeli airstrike. Haniya was one of the 400 who were exiled to Lebanon and helped establish ties with Hezbollah and today runs the organization from an office in Doha the capital of Qatar. His deputy is Yaha Sinwar, who manages the day-to-day -day operations from inside Gaza. 
the former head of Hamas's security service, Sinwar is known as the Butcher of Khan Yunis for his readiness to execute any alleged Palestinian collaborators with Israel. The group's military is led by Mohammed Diaf, a shadowy figure whose nom de guerre means the guest because of his reported habit of staying with a different supporter each night to evade capture. Diaf is the mastermind behind Hamas's tunnel networks, which run underneath Gaza and across its borders, both into Israel and Egypt. The Egyptian crossings are used to bring in supplies and weapons, making Hamas millions each month in tax, with the weapons then hidden in tunnels underneath the enclave. Egypt closed most of the tunnels in 2013, and these days, Iranian boats are used to dump weapons caches offshore to be collected by Hamas frogmen. The tunnels into Israel are used to launch surprise raids to kill and capture both soldiers and civilians. Israeli intelligence also credits Diaf with Hamas's rocket attacks and believe he used his training as a bomb maker to build some of the first. These days, Hamas is thought to possess up to 10,000 rockets with a range of up to 155 miles, enough to hit anywhere in Israel. Diaf's right-hand man is Marwan Issa, who is known as the architect of Hamas's military structure and a battlefield tactician who was almost certainly heavily involved in Saturday's atrocities. Between 2009 and 2021, Diaf and Issa waged four wars on Israel that used increasingly sophisticated weapons and tactics on an ever-increasing scale. But none of them came anywhere close to what the world witnessed last week. That attack, which Diaf has dubbed Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, was seemingly launched to derail yet another peace process, the Abraham Accords. Under the Accords, Arab states have been cutting ties with the Palestinians and normalizing relations with Israel, led by the UAE and Bahrain in 2020. US brokered talks were thought to be ongoing with Saudi Arabia, which would have left both the Palestinians and Hamas's ally Iran badly isolated. Saturday's attack has already put a stop to those talks, but the implications are much broader than that. Hamas seems to have been betting on a massive retaliation by Israel into Gaza to provoke Hezbollah, militants in the West Bank, and Iranian proxies in Syria into joining the conflict. Acutely aware of this, the US has sent an aircraft carrier group to Israel to try and deter additional attacks. But if America gets involved, it could ignite the whole region in a conflict that Hamas no doubt hopes will end with Israel being scrubbed from the map. The Hamas raid on Israel was unlike any attack. One entirely new tactic was the use of paragliders, dozens of which flew over the border in the opening stages of the attack and led assaults on military outposts and a music festival. Hamas seems to have been taking notes from the war in Ukraine, where low and slow moving aircraft have sometimes been able to hide from air defenses. This appears to have been the case on Saturday, as IDF forces on the border of the approaching paragliders until it was too late. Another tactic Hamas seems to have learned from watching the Ukrainians is the effectiveness of grenade dropping drones. Videos taken during the attack showed at least one radar array being blown up by a grenade dropped from the drone, blinding Israel's defenses. And another showed what appeared to be a fatal hit on a Makava tank, evading the tank's strongest armor on the front by targeting it for above, where it is weakest. Salvos of low-tech suicide drones and mortars mixed in with regular missiles can overwhelm even the best air defenses. Putin's forces have used the tactic to attack Ukrainian power plants and Hamas used it to strike Israeli towns and cities. In the opening salvo alone, the terrorists are thought to have fired anywhere between two and a half thousand and five thousand missiles, along with drones and homemade mortars. These were hidden in an extensive network of tunnels Hamas has dug underneath Gaza and only brought out at the last moment to avoid detection. Most were stopped by Israel's formidable Iron Dome, but dozens got through. Even while the drones, missiles and paragliders were storming into battle, Hamas fighters were blasting and bulldozing their way through the border fence and storming in by sea. The sheer scale of the attack, completely wrong-footed IDF soldiers, some of whom were shot dead in their barracks even before they could pick up their weapons. No doubt, much of the blame will ultimately come to rest on the shoulders of Israel's security services. 
And one of the biggest unanswered questions is, how did they not see this coming? But even if they had, the sheer scale and speed of it would have been hard to deal with, evidenced by the fact that, for hours afterwards, it was left to ragtag bands of police officers, border guards and soldiers to take up the fight until a coordinated response got underway. And it was three full days before Israel announced it was once again in control of the border. Israel has summoned up 300,000 military reservists, and a ground invasion of Gaza seems all but inevitable, though on an entirely different scale to what has been done in the past. The goal will almost certainly be to wipe out Hamas and any groups that come to their aid. But complicating the picture are 130 Israeli hostages being held in Gaza, whom Hamas has threatened to execute, and the threat of an attack from Hezbollah in the north. Israel's armed forces are technologically superior, but wary of Hezbollah's advanced missile arsenal and will be stretched very thin if forced to fight on two fronts at once. That appears to be why the US has sailed its most advanced aircraft carrier into the region along with missile destroyers, warning Hezbollah and its backers in Iran to think twice.